listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps aspiring professionals in film get where they're going faster by dissecting the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives in the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. I'm a filmmaker based in London, uh, so I have uh, recently started to uh, write and direct my own thing, but I'm also, I've been a VFX artist for the past uh, 13 years. I've, uh, I wrote and directed two short films. The first one uh, is called Strange Beasts, and uh, the most recent one is called This Time Away. And at the moment, I'm uh, working on many projects, actually, so I'm pitching on a feature film, which I didn't write, but um, I enjoyed very much. So uh, I'm currently pitching on it. Uh, I'm writing my own feature film, but I'm also working on uh, an animated feature film, which is uh, just as a previous artist. Um, That's it. Magali Barbet, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you. Well, you're more than welcome, and I want to give this audience a deeper sense of who you are, and uh, I'll do that by pulling a little bit from your bio. Of course, this is the internet, so you can tell me if it's wrong or not updated, Uh, so feel free to jump in on that. But uh, I'll start here. Uh, Magali Barbe is a director who blurs the lines between sci-fi and reality. Having studied fine art in Paris before moving to London, She started in visual effects as an animator. Driven by her passion for storytelling, she wrote, produced, and directed her first short film, Strange Beasts. Her work has been selected in over 30 festivals worldwide and was awarded with a Vimeo staff pick. She has gone on to direct her next short film, This Time Away, starring acclaimed actor Timothy Spall. This Time Away won Best Foreign Film at the L.A. Shorts Fest and has amassed nearly a million views in the past 12 months. That's incredible. And I want to start right there because... Uh, it sounds right when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, left, I left a lot of things off. Five wins, 12 nominations, uh, the Aesthetic of Short Film Award. Uh, that That's which is so difficult. So many people around the world submit to Aesthetica. So it, you are a tremendous filmmaker and an artist. And watching your films, I, I want to start with them because they, they, are, they are both beautiful and thought-provoking. They, they almost give me... Oh, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. They, they, they almost give me a Black Mirror vibe. Uh, oh. <laughs> they, they, they feel like they have... There's a twist to it. There's a sense of dystopia and hope at, at the same time. It's, it's, it's an interesting take and viewpoint and POV that you have. And so I, I want to start there are, w- with this question. Are your films a, a warning mm. or are they a thesis on hope and optimism? Uh, well, I guess a bit, of, I mean, it's an easy answer, but probably a bit of both. Um, but I'm not, when I did Strange Beast, I wasn't trying to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-tech because I, I heard that a lot. Um, and, but I'm definitely not anti-technology. Um, I just, and something I, I usually tell my friend is like, I'm fascinated and scared by it, but I think like a lot of people. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just an, my general view on that. And I think it reflects, I mean, Strange Beast, Strange Beast reflects uh, that very much, I think. But um, I mean, if some people see it as a, as a warning, fine. <laughs> but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't meant to be really, no. Yeah, Strange Beasts, and I want to contextualize it for for the audience. Strange Beast is a film in which uh, 
it's, it's really about augmented reality and where it can go, how far it can go. And so you're able, it kind of starts like a, a commercial pitch almost where it's single camera that, that, you know, your, your protagonist is talking directly to us, the audience, it seems like. And he's talking about the benefits of creating this pet essentially, but it's not real. And as you start to see what his life's like, you can be inspired by it or you could be, you know, uh, feel, feel terrible for him, uh, be sad, yeah, actually, be saddened by it. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Actually it's funny because, um, strange beast started the way it started. It wasn't even meant to be a, sh- a short film. It wasn't really meant to be a narrative. Uh, I just wanted to make a, 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 a hoax, uh, and I wanted to make a fake commercial. So the, <laughs> the short stuff, stuff like that, actually, uh, I kept that, uh, and, and then I pitched it to a, a few friends because I needed help with VFX and, and the shoot and everything. And uh, well, everyone liked it. Uh, and they, they were all like, oh, you know, it's, it's such a cool idea, but it should be a narrative. It should be stronger. And then it became a narrative. But um, the first idea was really just to make a fake commercial for a really cool game uh, that actually doesn't exist. That was uh, the start of Strange Beasts. Oh, I love that. I love that because... <laughs> So, so many discoveries are made that way. So many discoveries, whether it be in the arts or science uh, or whatever field you're in, they, they don't come from the application side of what you're trying to do. Um, so often it just comes from um, the, the, the curiosity that happens and the magic that happens when you start doing a thing for the sake of doing it. Yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah, just... Um I guess this one, I I mean, I have amazing memories of this project because it was very spontaneous, you know, like you start something thinking like, oh, I'm going to do this little project on the side. It's going to be fun. Uh, And then, you know, you get friends who like it and want to help. I mean, I I guess it starts like that for for lots of people, right? Yeah, it's it's. It's a fascinating thing. I, I, I do this all the time um, where I, it seems like I'll be fascinated by something that I think most people will find very mundane, but, but I find it beautiful. But it always happens when I'm just tinkering around. Um, you know, I've played piano for the majority of my life, and I was sitting down at my piano uh, just a couple of days ago, and uh, I'm messing around in, in F sharp major, and that's basically all black keys. And then it has like an F and then a, and then a B in it. Those are the white keys, but they don't get along at all. Right. Mm. Like they sound terrible together, especially when you play them together close. But if you play them separately, like let's say three octaves apart. So maybe the, the B on the high end and the F on the low end, they actually sound beautiful together. And uh, I thought, man, that's a metaphor for a relationship. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Like a good, a, a good relationship, right? Like the kind where if you let me be me and I'll let you be you, we can play. This can sound beautiful, but if yeah, we get too yeah. close and I smother you and you smother me and we're too close together, it creates conflict. Yeah. I mean, in any relationship, conflict is hard to avoid anyway. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and so I've been playing uh, for 20 plus years and that just occurred to me the other day. So I love being surprised by sort of what the universe pushes to you. If you just go out and create, um, I, I love that story before I move over to this time away, uh, your other short film that that's award winning and, and incredible. Um, was it intentional for your protagonist in strange beasts to be alone in the park at the end? So just again, for the audience, uh, mm. This, the protagonist is, finds himself in the park, and I won't give the spoiler away with, with the other piece, but or I won't spoil the other piece that gives the movie away. But he's in the park, and yeah, he's just, he's talking to all of his fake sort of created uh, friends. Uh, but from our viewpoint, from uh, the audience's POV, he's just simply talking to himself. He's a, he's a complete um, lunatic. 
<laughs> and, but but one of the things I noticed was that he was in the park all by himself. And I thought, oh, that's oh. because everyone else in the world is inside with their fake friends, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's completely intentional. Yes, of course. Um, we, you know, to and face to uh, increase the uh, um, feeling of loneliness, because that's the idea of, uh, well, one of the main idea of, of that story. Yeah. It's very much the theme. It's very much loneliness. So, um, yeah, we made sure to shoot uh, early in the morning, so the park would be empty. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great film because it starts off uh, giving you hope for technology and, and excitement for augmented reality, but you know slowly moves into these overtones of of loneliness and sadness that. Um, who knows? It could befall us as, as humanity. So um, speaking of humanity, let's talk about uh, <laughs> your, your other short film. Nice transition. There you go. <laughs> this time away. This time away was it's incredible. And I don't think it's a spoiler to to talk about Max, the robot. And I'm curious about this because the animation on that was so great. I wasn't sure if I was looking at a drawing right away, I wasn't sure if I wasn't looking at something physical, but before we get into oh, that, Oh, mm-hmm. it was, it was great. Before we get into that, I, I'm curious for the inspiration, curious about the inspiration for Max was, it seems like an homage to short circuit and to Wally, but sort of mixed together. Oh, interesting. So I have to tell you the truth. I haven't seen short circuit. So I, I heard about <laughs> him twice, uh, in a, in a month, so I really have to, to check it out. Um, um, Wally, it's more like the opposite, because uh, when I was working with Ronan, who's uh, uh, the character designer for, for Max, for the robot, mm-hmm. uh, it was actually part of the of the pitch, was uh, we want a void to look like Wally. Uh, I love the design of Wally. I think it's really perfect. Um, it's brilliant, but you just don't want to... You know, you just don't want to copy that. So we purposely uh, made it uh, round, actually, round shapes, when Wally is more like a, a cube, really. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. But yeah, we, we purposely want it to not look like Wally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Ronan did an amazing job. He, I mean, he's a very talented character designer. Um, very much into robots, <laughs> so he was like my default choice uh, straight away. Um, and uh, yeah, he, we worked. Uh, um, oh, oh, the the uh, other thing about the design, uh, part of the brief was to make it look a bit vintage. Yes, like was, uh, you know the, the texture and the, the render of it, it reminds a little bit of. Uh, uh, vintage ap- appliances, you know, like um, 70s kind of, you know, um, right. because we want always wanted to have this mix. And this is part of the art direction of the film is, is to have this mix of all the new. Um, I wish we had a bit more, actually, of uh, technological stuff in the film. Uh, but then, you know, uh, budget. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and in the end, I'm very happy with the result anyway. So uh, all good on that. How many different designs did you go through for Max before you landed on that, the final design? Uh, so the, the way most character designers work is that they would produce very quick sketches of like, I mean, it really depends on, on, on artists, but... Um, Ronan did maybe 15 or more very quick sketches, you know, different shapes, mm-hmm. uh, sizes, you know, uh, size of the arm that, uh, and shapes of the arm that vary from one another. Uh, and from there, uh, you know, you start to mix it up and, um, and um, sort of like narrow it down to the final design, really. But yeah, it started, yeah, maybe 14, 15 different shapes. To, to get that one. Yeah, it's incredible. And again, for the audience, with this time away, you introduce a concept that I'm not sure I've seen 
uh, in this way, which is we live in a future in which... So the robot looks vintage, but we're obviously in a future place, a future time, where it's not a surprise that a robot could be... Um, could 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 perform tasks for people in their home and do things like this. And, but here we have a robot who wants to repay a debt to a human being. So just the idea that the robot can recognize that this, this lonely man has saved his life and now he wants to and then take this very human re- approach to that and say, I owe you a debt, Right. Now, mm-hmm. there's a twist even at the end of that, which I won't give away, but that concept is, is, is fascinating. And, and it made me think about this, um, this question, which is, you know, what is your greatest fear you know, for humanity Ooh. as we integrate deeper with machines and software and technology? Well, that's a big, <laughs> a big one. I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, my biggest fear. I mean, biggest fear. I mean, on, I'm not, I, I guess I, I would consider myself more like an observer. Um, so it's, it's more, yeah, it's more about observation. Um, technologies are driving the world pretty much. You know, it, it got so so much bigger and faster, and and you know, it's exponential. So. That's one thing, um, but it, and while, you know, loneliness is actually, I read that somewhere, one of the biggest, you know, issues of the 21st century or something, um, while all those technologies are meant to connect people to each other, um, mm-hmm. and they do in, in, in many ways. So, um, yeah, that's one observation, and, and uh, but I, I don't know if I have like a specific yeah, I think the virus thing is the most likely <laughs> to happen, you know, um, and we are very much into it. But uh, honestly, yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, if, if your question is about like, do you think technology will, you know, overcome humanity? I, I don't really see this kind of scenario. I think it's more about issue in terms of observation. It's you know, algorithms already decide what what you're going to watch next. Um, Etc. So, I think I think technology is is so big and so it's so wide and so fast. That's a fact, you know. Uh, and it is indeed a bit scary. But then it's very much about what you do about it. Like I like to, to think that um, it's it's a tool, really. Um, very powerful, uh, amazing tool. So it, it, it's it's really up to people uh, to decide what what they do about it. Yeah, because this time away shows sort of the hopeful and optimistic side, the usefulness of of our deeper integration and and cohabitation with machines and technology mm-hmm. and, and software and and how it can be used to uplift someone's life. Yeah, those things actually exist already. Um, I read something about um, robots for, um, you know, like as personal helps for uh, elderly people. Mm-hmm. Um, and while, you know, I'm not talking senile people, um, they perfectly know it's a robot, but they proved somehow that, it, you know, it will lift their mood and it, it still creates a presence. You still know it's a robot. It's a, it's still a machine, you know. But uh, nevertheless, it's still a presence, and it's something that sort of like look, looks at you um, and uh, creates some sort of company, you know. So yeah, this does exist already, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, and and it probably exists. I'm not sure it exists in the way that it does in the short film, but. But if it does, then that's kind of, you know, heartwarming uh, and a good application for it. But I think to your point, a lot of times the the credo of, of 
big tech is move fast and break things. And so, so their idea is let's just, let's just roll it out and then we'll figure out how to make it into something as we go along. Right. Mm. And we've seen that fail and we've seen that succeed and we've seen, and, and there's a lot of things that are in the middle. Like, for example, I think social media right now is an example of move fast and break things. And then we're figuring out, Hmm, we designed, yeah. we designed social media to bring people together, but it seems to cause people to fight. And we didn't expect that. Or it brings groups together, but it also creates fights. And those fights are at scale. And because they're at scale, they're more dangerous. Right? Yes, I know. Yeah, absolutely. And I see what you're saying about uh, break things. Um, it's just, I mean, internet and connecting people like that, it's so powerful, I guess. There's a lot of things. Uh, like you said, which happened that were not expected. Uh, fair enough. I mean, it's, uh, I say this kind of thing is pretty much impossible to, uh, to plan. <laughs> right. Um, it's, it's like everything you don't know before it exists, right? You just, you can just, uh, create and, and, and see what happens, I guess. Um, you can, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who, who still, uh, try their best to, um, uh, you know, plan those things and, and um, uh, minimize risk or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, what happens on social media, I, it's funny because I don't find it surprising at all. I mean, it's so kind of logic, <laughs> you know, it's uh, <laughs> like it's like humanity concentrated in like one big place. Uh, there's a lot of positive outcome and, and of course a lot of all the hate and also you know the fact that it's anonymous in many still on many platforms um which is important of course but uh but yeah people feel like they are not uh they can do whatever they want so i mean it's it's not a big surprise right um to see what happens uh, unfortunately yeah, exactly. And, you know, it was supposed to be the marketplace of ideas. And the, and the point of it is, OK, if somebody posts a bad idea, the market place of ideas and the other thoughts in that market, let's say, would push that bad idea down. Um, but what I think we're finding out, the unexpected part is, is that we're entertained by the bad idea. So we don't necessarily suppress it, even if we don't believe it. So even if we don't like the idea, instead of suppressing it, which is what we were taught in school would happen, right, in the marketplace of ideas, instead we're entertained by it and then it gets promoted through likes and interactions, impressions and engagements. And I think that was the the unexpected part of it. And, you know, and now, I, you know, I think the thing we have to look out for are things like deep fakes. They, they did a deep fake video of uh, Tom Cruise recently. And, and I haven't seen that. I'm oh, checking it, it up. <laughs> oh, it's 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 photorealistic. It's it's scary. And there's one part. I find these deep fakes, the, the leaks. I mean, you know, there's always this uncanny valley. Um, of course, when you don't know it's a deep fake, it's easy to get um, tricked uh, by it. Yeah, tricked, uh, yeah. In, in, but for the first few seconds, but uh, if I see something, because I guess it's very much up to people to um uh analyze it you know and uh if i see tom cruise saying something i mean i haven't seen that video but if you say something completely insane or uh weird uh i would probably triple check <laughs> you know yeah yeah i think we i think we do need a verification system um a paid for service someone needs to create it Maybe it'll be you, maybe it'll be me, but we need a verification system ASAP for photos Mm -hmm. and video because this was the best. I've seen a lot of deep fake videos. This was the best one I've ever seen in terms of, uh, you know, you really couldn't tell until there there was one moment where he does a quick movement and you could see there was a blur there. And it's like, oh, that Mm -hmm. that's that's the giveaway right there. But but this is the, the cutting edge of this. So when. You know, 10 years from now, I don't know if you'll be able to tell one way or the other without a verification service. So it's a it's an interesting conversation to have with the backdrop being your films, by the way. 
And, um, you know, I would, I would encourage everyone listening to go to, to the website, uh, this person does not exist.com and have your mind blown away. Uh, when you realize every person on that page isn't real. And, um, if you're thinking about the way, what we're doing with genealogy and CRISPR, and that's, that's one of those move fast and break things type of technologies where, it can have some bad uses and good uses. I would say look up, like just Google bully whippets, for example, <laughs> if, you want, if you want to get a, uh, an idea of what you could do with your own genes and, and how you could do, uh, you know, double up your muscle fiber of your designer baby, for example. So there's a lot to look into and, and, and it's an interesting topic, but I digress. I want to talk a little bit about what you've, done for the last 13 years, which is being a, am I pronouncing this right? A, 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 a previous artist? Previous, yeah. Um, well, animation, I started as a CG generalist. Um, and then I got the first, um, my first long job, um, in a VFX company called Framestore, mm-hmm. uh, on, well, a not so brilliant film called Prince of Persia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and I became an animator, a VFX CG animator. So, um, yeah. so for the audience, can, can you explain to us what the role of a previous artist is in film production? Because you did this for Wonder Woman and uh, you course, did it for yeah. Kingsman and you did it for Avengers Endgame as well. Yeah, of course. So, so like I said, yeah, I, I um, started as an animator, uh, so which consists in uh, moving. Really, uh, it's all e- e- everything movement uh, on a, a CG production. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that can be an animated film, commercials, uh, TV, all VFX. Because there's a lot of CG. Uh, in some movies, not all of them, <laughs> specifically mm-hmm. blockbusters. Um, but uh, yeah, and from that, I um, moved into previs, which is um, more part of the pre-production, but we are using the same tools, meaning CG tools. We use the same softwares and the same similar skills, uh, but it's more about cameras. So basically on Wonder Woman, for instance, you you have um, a, reprodu- a, a reproduction, really, of the of the set, um, of the film set in CG. You have uh, 3D models of the actors, actresses, uh, and you create action sequences, mostly, because it's a lot of uh, money saving for production to check if uh, an action sequence actually works prior to the shoot. So that's very much what Previs is about, actually, uh, mostly for action sequences. Um, and yeah, so you generally do, it's like it's very much like animated storyboard, sort of. Yeah, that's fascinating to me. And uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, by the way. I saw your animation reel and I saw that, that uh, uh-huh. Previs reel you have. And it's... It's stunning just to see how sort of accurate it is to what actually gets shot. Um, so the animated version versus the the live action version, or or the or, yeah. the, or the blended version. It's. I got lucky though on Wonder Woman, and I mean, because when you watch, if you watched my reel, like like any uh, previous uh, artist reel, uh, I picked the shots they kept. <laughs> but <laughs> I kept the shot for my reel of Disney. I used the shot that they kept for the film. But you produce a lot of sequences that are never going to be used. Um, again, it's a pre production. So you throw a lot away. So you, sh- you don't get, I mean, and that's okay. It's part of the, it's the nature of the job, actually. You try stuff. Sometimes you think it works, but the directors won't like it. Sometimes he or she hasn't even seen it. You know, it, it's just a uh, pre-production work. So uh, if you're lucky, <laughs> uh, 
a, a, a few of your shots uh, make it to the cut, yeah. One of the cool things is that you're working at the storyboard level. And so you're seeing the makings, the, the, the construct of a story in a lot of ways. And yeah, what was, was that experience, that background you have, did, did that help you in the making of your own independent mm, films? Not true. To be honest, I'm, well, it doesn't help you write a screenplay to the previous, uh, to the previous, you need a basic understanding of, uh, cinematography, um, cinematography in general, um, and you need the CG animation skills, of course, uh, but it's not like, I mean, I get to read screenplays or parts of screenplays w- once in a while on most projects that if you do previews, you have to know what you're going to previews, right? Um, mm-hmm. But um, I wouldn't say, I mean, the motivation for writing direct demand stuff is, is something else. I think it's more... Um, you know, you want to do your own thing. Uh, that's very much what it is. When you work on uh, in VFX, uh, previous or animation or whatever a stage of VFX, um, it is interesting in many ways. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not your project. Uh, you're not responsible for the of the quality of the <laughs> of mm-hmm. it. You're not responsible for the screenplay, the story. You know. Right. You, are part of this big machine, really. Um, and yeah, it's a good way of learning some some things. On this, on both my shots, my, my CG skills were actually quite helpful because, um, I mean, I couldn't afford to pay a studio <laughs> to, uh, to do the VFX, uh, that's for sure. And I got, um, I'm really happy that people very much enjoyed the animation of, of Max, of the robot. Um, and I guess, yeah, being an animator, I might be a little more um, demanding, maybe, on, on animation, um, of course. So that kind of things help, yeah. Then, um, yeah, I mean, then some storyboarders get into direction, but not not as many as I thought, to be honest, you know, so. Yeah. And, and I I would say that your short films look every bit as quality in every aspect as a feature film would look. So that, that, Uh that high standard definitely came through the camera work, your cinematographer, uh, Gabby, like. um, He's brilliant. Yeah. She's so good. I mean, yeah, she's. It was amazing to to be working with her. Yeah, it 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 showed on on film. It came out, and then the the animation was brilliant. So so maybe I I would ask the question. I'd re ask it this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you learn making your films that you didn't already know, or or that maybe took you by surprise? Because you'd been on that production side for so long, like you said, part of a big machine making a film. But ultimately, the buck doesn't stop with you. But when it's your film, it, it definitely does stop with you. So mm. was there anything that took you by surprise that you didn't already know or, or anything funny, that you learned? I tell you a funny know? anecdote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, when we just just so you know, when I shot Strange Beast, which was 2016, mm-hmm. or released 2017. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, OK, lots of stress because that, that's one thing. One thing is a lot of stress because um, unlike VFX, I would say even unlike CG, when where you you're behind a computer, and in CG you can there's no um, not as much pressure as you have on on, on set because on set everything has to happen like now <laughs> you know mm-hmm. uh, when in CG like um, you know you can control that everything basically. You can save your scene, you can redo it, you can, uh, when you're on, on the set and you have a limited amount of time and money, you need to be fast and super fast thinking. So that's one thing that I've learned for sure. And uh, to tell you how much of a beginner I was when I, I, I shot uh, Strange Beast, everything was ready. First day, first morning, you know, 
first um, take on the first shot. Um, everyone's ready. Everyone's waiting for me. And my, my first assistant slash friend, Amelie, she's like, action. I was like, what? Action. Say action. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so that's how, you know, how much of a beginner I was really. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, action. So anyway, um, <laughs> no, you learn, I, I've learned to handle, you need to be multitask. That's, that's something I've learned, like constantly, all day, uh, nonstop, you know, that's, uh, and that's a lot. And that's uh, amazing and, and good fun. But yeah, you, you need to have a good night's sleep and to be fully awake <laughs> and like 200 person already um, from start to finish there. Yeah. That's perfect. I want to stay in that vein a little bit and ask you, what are the two best pieces of advice you've received so far in your career and who did they come from? So, okay, I had that question uh, once. I'm terrible at advice. I'm terrible at uh, giving it and taking it. So, (laughs) (laughs) I'm, and okay, if I had maybe one sort of advice, it would be like, I don't know how relevant those are in the way that everyone's different, every production is different, and everyone has his or her own way to do things. So someone might say, oh, you know, like, be be more patient. Well, patience is actually a good quality to have, but some actually being not very patient myself, um, I think it did help me to achieve both projects. Because you need this little bit of, you know, um, not being patient help me push things, go forward. Uh, because sometimes you just don't have a choice. When you have a limited budget, sometimes like no budget at all, uh, but you still need things to get done. Uh, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's a tough one. But um, advice, not really, I... I, I don't like it so much. <laughs> I don't like to take advice because, okay, and that's very, I intend to be like that. Maybe maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. It doesn't matter. It's just the way I am. But I um, I I generally find advice very patronizing, you know, and it's just like, okay, you did your own thing your way and I do my own thing my way and that's how it is. And yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. And if the results are the kind of results you've gotten, I don't, you know, that could be advice in itself. Do your own thing, do it your own way. And I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and move forward. Um, you know, this audience is all over the globe. And so I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to ask you what the differences are, if, if you can speak to it. I'm not sure if you can, but mm-hmm. but if you can, the differences between working in film in the UK versus France versus the U S are there, are there key differences that you can speak to? Um, well, yeah, there are are many differences. I, I, I don't have, well, in VFX, uh, first of all, there's barely an industry in France, for instance. Um, it, it has to do with, um, tax breaks and uh, most companies are based in the UK. Uh, there's a few in the US. Mm-hmm. So honestly, I, my my whole career, I, I started in London. Uh, I never worked as a VFX artist in France actually. So uh, I know a few people who work in, who work in animation. They have a MacGuff, a Illumination MacGuff who do Despicable Me and all of that. So is based in, based in Paris. Um, and about making short films and films in general, um, well, for short films, uh, at least because I haven't done uh, my, my first feature yet, uh, I know it's very different, not not because of uh, my own shot, but also my, my partner has directed um, a few shots in France. And it's true that in France, they have more uh, financial help. They have the CNC, uh, Centre National de la Cinématographie, that mm. actually has money to finance short films. And it's, it's you know, consequent uh, money. Um, they have, um, they finance many shorts every year. 
uh, when here they do have a little bit, but not much to be honest. So it's more DIY kind of project, but it's also easier to find people who will help, you know, um, right. I mean, unpaid, <laughs> even though it's not ideal. I know it's not ideal, and, but um, people do it. Honestly, on this time away, everyone was uh, professional, like had a lot of experience and they did it because they wanted to, you know, um, they had a bit of free time. <clears throat> they were happy to help. And that's something I love about this industry. Uh, people are keen to help. At least that's something I've seen, which which was great, uh, amazing, to be honest. In France, because there, there is money for shots, it's more like it's almost an industry. Um, it's a small economy, of course, but it's still, you know, um, people would, ex would really very much do it as a job. They get paid. Um, <clears throat> so maybe they are not going to be as... I don't know, friendly and passionate about the project, if that makes sense. Yes. It's just another job. So, yeah, it's a bit different in, in, in that way. And in the U.S., I, I honestly have no idea. Um, the industry, yeah. of course, is different. The overall industry of, of filmmaking is, is bigger. And uh, Hollywood, I mean. Well, um, we, we got to get you over here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it's funny because after Strange this that's when I got the reps, um, uh, agents, and it was, you know, that was amazing. Uh, it, they call it the water bottle tour, which I, I didn't know about before I had one. Um, so, you know, touring the producers and, um, yeah, we, we should, we should touch on that just briefly because there are so many aspiring filmmakers that, that will be hearing this interview. And if, if you, we always talk about, well, you make a short as a resume builder, or you make a short mm -hmm. to give you or, 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 or create a sort of a concept for a feature. But another reason you make a really great short film is to get representation. I mean, you, you were able to make these short films and get, you know, represented by UTA and, and zero gravity here in the U S and that's a big deal because that 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 means you have someone working on your behalf uh, to put you into projects. I think I, I think it's a, a good point to make that, yeah. that that you can be all around the world with your representation, even if your film happens somewhere uh, outside of, let's say, you know, Hollywood. Yeah, of course. No, that's for that internet is amazing, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so when when I finished Transbiz, I put it. Uh, online straight away and then i did a few festival but afterwards i i, I thought like this project is perfect it has to go online because it you know because of the fake commercial thing etc mm -hmm. uh, so i was sure about that and then i started to so i remember oh this is a funny story okay what i wanted was a staff pick i admit it i know it's not i'm not proud of it but you see I, i'm honest <laughs> 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 so i posted it on vimeo and I was like, oh, I hope I'm going to get a staff pick because clearly on Vimeo, it's changed a bit through the years. But if you don't get get a staff pick, you, you, you know, no one's going to see it. Right. Like, That's it, right. It's a bit tough, yeah. On YouTube, it's quite different. They have a different algorithm. But, um, so, yeah, I, know I, want, I knew I wanted the staff pick and I got it. Um, and I was so happy. So I celebrated with my boyfriend. We opened a good bottle of whatever. Uh, and then he's like, okay, let's go for dinner. I invite you to some restaurant or whatever. And I just check my emails before I go. And I see an email from like, I think it was Fox, the first one, or I can't remember. Um, like a big studio, you know. And I'm like, hey, wait a sec, I have an email from a, Fox, a guy from Fox. And <laughs> he's like, okay, let's check it later. And then we go for dinner and I came back and had like another like, 10 or 15 emails. And I was like, what, what, <laughs> what the hell? This is crazy. Because like, yeah, I mean, I don't know about other film. I don't know that many other filmmakers, but honestly, like I did this, it was so spontaneous, this project. I just thought it was fun to do, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but apparently in Hollywood, they thought, lots of people thought it was a proof of concept and it wasn't. Um, 
was really this standalone shot. Uh, but anyway, so I got all those emails and I started to reply because people were asking for, um, you know, just a chat, um, a Zoom chat or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got this email from my manager, who's still my ma- my manager, Mark. And I explained everything. I'm like, I was panicking, you know. I was like, oh my god, I got all those emails. What do I do? What do I do? And then he was like, okay, Mark, don't, don't, don't. Um, first of all, do I, do you want me to represent you? I was like, does that mean you're gonna help me? So yes, please represent me. <laughs> and and then um, the funny thing is, I was working on Fantastic Beast. Um, the first one, I think, uh, Previs, you know, uh, mm-hmm. for one. And uh, the producer of Fantasy Beast is David Ayman, who's a lovely, the most lovely man really on earth. is amazing. Um, I mean, I didn't know him before. I, when I was working in Previs, I, never, I had never met him. But mm-hmm. what happened is I tell my f- a friend at work what what's happening to me. Because I was still working full time, yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, as a VFX artist, so and he's like, "Ah, oh, that's that's really cool. Look, I'm gonna send an email to uh, to David Heyman, and um, and maybe he can help." And I was like, "What, David Heyman, like the producer?" Was that? Yeah, 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 don't worry. And he did, and David Heyman called me, <laughs> <laughs> um, like I don't know, one, one afternoon, a few days later, and and uh, I explained everything to him. And he's like, okay, I'm going to recommend you to a good friend of mine. He's an agent at UTA. And let's take it from there. And and he, he was like, you're, you're probably going to go to LA. And, and you know, he, he knows he knows the whole thing. He's used to it, you know, helping young talents or whatever. And then I spoke to UTA. And then they made me come to LA. And then I met, yeah, I, I think it was two weeks with like, five meetings a day or something. It was a bit crazy. Um, but like, like, like very nice, <laughs> crazy nice, right. but crazy. You know, even when I think of it today, I'm like, ah, it, it feels a bit like a dream, like not real, you know? Um, so yeah, that's. It's, it's, it's an amazing butterfly effect. Uh, it, it's, it's a crazy domino effect that you put something out in the world, you're just doing it. And then before you know it, even before you can go out to dinner <laughs> to celebrate being a Vimeo staff pick, your inbox is filling up because I think I think deep down everybody knows that talent is so rare and and so obvious that when you see it, you know it, and so you don't want to miss out on it. And I think that's why you why you got all those messages. And and for those people that. Yeah. And, and for those people that don't get that kind of feedback, it it might not necessarily mean that, that the talent isn't there, but it does mean something. And uh, we shouldn't lie to ourselves about it. Just go yeah, back I mean, out there, swing again and see if you can do something even better. Yeah. And to be honest, that's like, OK, I mean, I'm very flattered of obviously that a lot of people think you know, see something, it's like, oh, she might have talent or she has talent. Uh, the thing is, it's on the long run because you meet all those people. That's very nice. Uh, but then you have to prove yourself then. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and that takes time because from doing one little short to directing your a feature film, it's a big step. Um, so that was all very nice um, and amazing. But that still doesn't mean anything. And not, I wouldn't say anything. It, do, it doesn't mean it's not the end of the of the road. You know, it's just the very, very, very beginning. So right. uh, I think the way I, I understand it is that what the, those general meetings, that's how they call it, um, meet new talent, la la la, um, they probably do it with like, I don't know how many people a week, a month, you know, uh, but among like a hundred people, maybe one <laughs> will direct the feature, and among this uh, another hundred people who directed the first feature, maybe five will direct the second one. You see what I mean? It's like 
Yeah. It's just never ending story. It's like, oh yeah, that was all very nice. You should enjoy it when it happens. Um, but then it's actually also the start of um, the, the, the real um, difficulty, I'd say, because when I did Strange Beast, nobody was expecting anything from me. You know, I, I, it was out of nowhere, just for fun. Uh, but then you have like, you, you feel like the pressure a little bit. It's like, oh, now I should deliver. <laughs> you, know, I should, uh, uh, or, you know, you feel like some people think you might have talent, but do you? You know, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a tough question because... Um, it, I mean, I guess it's, it's a big question for any any artist, right? It's like it's, you have to, to keep training and searching and um, and and work work hard and you know be patient. But while all of these songs, I mean, it was great, uh, but yeah, it's just it could be the start of something. That's what right. it is. Yeah, it's like before the short, you were an animator, and after the short, you are, you know, Magali Barbet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's so, like people expect something from you, which suddenly makes everything really very different, you know? Um, that's right. Yeah. And, and filmmaking is this um, uh, permissionless work. It's, it's, it's got, you know, it's, it's infinite leverage when you can make your own film. Um, but with that, the most important skill you can have is judgment. And so when someone now expects you to, to show that you're talented, the biggest skill you need to have is judgment on, on whatever your next project is. And that can be stressful for, for sure. Um, we've talked a lot about what your films are about and, and the, the, the mix of the humanities and technology that, that permeates all of your work. But uh, I'm wondering which creatives do you most admire and, and want to emulate? Oh, uh, like names. Mm-hmm. Ooh, um, okay. I have a very wide <laughs> kind of taste, I think. Um, recently, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, I don't have like one big hero, you know, like, oh, I want to be this guy or that woman. <laughs> um, right. but, um, well, yeah, I, I do love sci-fi. Um, so I guess, I mean, the thing is, for instance, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of Christopher Nolan, uh, even though I enjoyed Interstellar, mm-hmm. um, I, I guess I'm more comfortable of talking about taste in general than like names, because I always feel like, oh, if I say that, I'm <laughs> I, um, I don't have many influences. I, I, I love animation, of course. I, I'm a big fan of Miyazaki, for instance. Um, like, I, I'm, funny enough, I, I'm, I'm a CG animator, but I, I prefer hand-drawn animation, generally. Mm-hmm. Um, I love any film that um, it's easy to say, but it needs to reach it needs to reach a certain level of humanity, you know, like um, good characters, and um, and if on top of that there's like a, a really great like so, so, something new. You know, I don't yeah. like to use the word concept too much, but something really fresh, like I, Parasite, uh, did that for me. You know, it was, I've seen a, a few Bong Joon Ho m- movie before, but this one, I was like, I mean, I was really blown away. Um, a mix of genres, I love that. Um, yeah. And something that surprises me. And I was really surprised with that film. Like, really. Anthony Mackie recently said, and, and he's sort of in this Marvel universe, and he's got a, a movie coming out uh, next month, big blockbuster film. Um, and he was talking about the, the problem with, you know, making like an Avengers Endgame and then continuing to make these sort of comic book 
tent pole movies is that the next one always has to be bigger than the previous one. So it has mm-hmm. to keep getting bigger and bigger and better and better and bigger and bigger. And that could be good for you um, for sure. But, but it goes back to what you said. He was saying the bigger it gets, the harder it is to tell a human story. The The harder it is to yeah. uh, a, attach a viewer to the humanity of the reality that these people are going through. And so I, I, I think it has to do with, I, I see what you're saying. I'm, I'm just, um, well, Anthony Mackie said it. But, but just, yeah, but. yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and again, yeah, it's probably his own experience makes him say that. Uh, but yeah, I think from what I understood, um, the, the most money is the most pressure. Mm-hmm. So, and the most, like, you want, you need to please everyone. Uh, and I mean, it's easy to, to say, it's going to sound a bit cliche, but if you try to please everyone, you, you might end up not pleasing anyone, you know? So That's, ex- that's uh, true. So true. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it has to do with the amount of, I mean, with the size, the scale of the film, I think it has to do with the pressure, the money causes, you know, for the, for distribution, etc. cetera. Uh, that might might make it less, you know, personal uh, and less risk taking. That's yeah, right. Probably. And that can that can definitely mess with a story. Oh man, this has been such a fun conversation. I've learned so much, and, <laughs> and you you are so wonderful. You're you're clearly a multi hyphenate. Uh, an animator, a visual effects artist, a director, a writer, a, a previs. I mean, you do it all. Um, where do you see yourself in the future? Are, are you going to stick with producing and directing? Or are you going to uh, go back to previs work? Are, are there pros and cons to either? I mean, <clears throat> what I'm, I'm trying to transition, really. That's what I've been trying to do since um, my first shot. Uh, since the release of, of my first shot. So uh, ideally, yeah, I want to write, direct. Um, p- producer, I, I don't know. I, I was more like a co-producer of both my shots by default, to be honest. Um, I I think I could enjoy it, but that's not like something I need to do. Uh, but uh, writing, directing is definitely where I'm heading. Yeah. Um, and I would love to do that uh, full time, so I don't have to uh, be partly a VFX artist and partly, you know, writer director. I, I'd rather, uh, yeah, be a full time writer director. Well, I love that, and I'm quite sure the world will be a better place for it. Um, <laughs> you've been so great with your time and, and so open with your answers. Uh, can you tell everybody? Magali, where they can find you on the internet and maybe see some of your work and, and, and find you on social media? Um, sure, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a, a website. Uh, it's just my name, uh, dot com, uh, magalibarbe.com. And I have an Instagram, which is, uh, Mag- I mean, I'm, I'm fairly recent to Instagram and I don't use it that much. Um, <laughs> but it's <laughs> magali.barbe, yeah first name dot last name um and, yeah, and, and for those listening it's spelled m-a-g-a-l-i b-a-r-b-e correct mm-hmm. <laughs> uh and that's it for social media um i'm not that too good at it to be honest but um, <laughs> i try i keep trying you know <laughs> Don't worry. You don't have to. It's it's okay. I I have this theory, and I think that my my partner in crime here, Nick, has the same feeling, which is that in a world where everyone is oversharing, the 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 play is to undershare. And <laughs> uh, you know when it's that old Mark Twain thing: if if everybody's thinking one thing, then it's time to stop and reflect and and maybe think of the other thing, uh, go the other direction. 
right? You don't want to be part yeah. of the herd necessarily. So uh, I, I, I'm totally fine with that. And hey, if you want to get online, there's always people who can do that for you anyway. <laughs> we, we, need, we need you freed up to, to write and make films and keep doing the beautiful work you're doing. Um, we can end it on this. Uh, you wrote a feature script recently. Uh, oh, can you I'm, let us I'm, know? I'm writing it. You're I'm writing speaking. it. Yeah. That's what, well, that's what I was going to ask. How is it going? And, and um, uh, what's it going to be about? So for this one, so I'd rather not say, sorry. Um, it's, okay. It's, it's, I can say it's, gen, it's general. Oh, okay. The main theme is anger. So mm. that's, uh, and it's, it's general. A bit like very, um, very grounded, but sl- sliding uh, a little bit towards uh, horror. Um, but subtle, you know, it's like not full horror film, but it's the very beginning, so you can still, you know, evolve a lot. Um, but I'm also pitching on this beautiful screenplay, so I didn't write it, but um, it, it won uh, an award actually, a screenplay award, um, two years ago, I think. Nice. And I contacted the writer, Aaron is lovely, and I pitched, pitched it to my agents first. And we've been working on it for like yeah a few few months now, so fingers crossed on that one. Um, so that one I wouldn't direct. I didn't write it. I mean we we've done a bit of rewrite with, with Aaron. Um, right, that that's always that's always yeah. the case. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get. But uh, yeah, no, this one, and then yeah, my own, my own screenplay, and um, yeah, I just have to uh, keep writing. And yeah, I would like i mean it's very likely i will direct a new shot hopefully shooting this summer so fingers crossed on this one as well yeah, absolutely fingers crossed i think uh we won't need it i think i think the world will be back to normal uh or what we think is normal uh very very <laughs> soon uh and and you'll get to shoot anything you want to shoot and uh, and it's ter- and in terms of just you creating things and just in terms of your talent i don't think you need any luck either um you're, you're going to do great things so oh, let's see. Natalie, uh this has been great thank, thank you so you much for your time and um i hope to see some of your work soon i hope we we stay in touch and, and i hope we get a chance to do a round two sure okay thanks a lot chris anytime talk to you soon okay bye bye You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative, and the show will pop right up. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Book Us to schedule a free discovery meeting and needs assessment. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.